can already pick up in my voice that I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. I think everybody's struggling a little bit now with all the, the pollen and all that's going on. And, uh, and so for a number of different reasons, I'm uh, struggling with that this evening, but um, got a cough drop in, and I'll try not to make that too obvious. But uh, uh, I, I want us to, to, to look at Revelation. I'll give you a handout to kind of follow along. Um, typically, when we do our study, I usually begin by by reading the scriptures and then uh, give you an introduction, and then we'll work kind of verse by verse through that handout or that uh, those verses. And that's typically how we do it. But I'm going to veer from that just a little bit tonight, and um, and and I I actually want to go back to chapter one for just a moment. You know, I think. One of the things that we uh, need to do is just kind of reorient ourselves where we are in this book, and and so we're we're beginning something really big tonight with with the uh, with the seals. Uh, there are seven seals, as we'll talk about in Revelation, and um, and 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 so when we when we start moving into this, I want us to keep in mind where we've been. And so as you're kind of looking through your Bible, there just to just as a reminder. Uh, what was going on in chapter one? Y'all remember? I mean, the, the introduction of the book, and who do we see this vision of in that first chapter? Yeah, Christ. So uh, the the vision is there in chapter one, and then moving into chapter two. In chapter three, we've got seven letters to seven churches, and you recall that in those seven letters to the seven churches. That in each one of those churches, that um, Jesus, who is writing these letters to the churches, that he draws from the images that are in chapter one. So we see this, these, this vision of Christ, and then those that vision of Christ in chapter one finds its place in every one of those seven letters. And then there's instruction that's written to each of those letters. Y'all see that with me? And in chapter four, not long ago. We looked at this scene in heaven, and we talked much about in this scene, as uh, John enters into the throne room, that um, what is absent is man. Humanity is absent. Uh, in fact, we don't see man introduced until uh, Jesus. He's the first man in heaven. But even the description of Jesus, as we saw in chapter 5 last week, which Corey uh, covered last week with you, and I thought it did an excellent job. I, I had an opportunity to to watch it before tonight, and honestly, Corey, I, I, I thought it was an excellent presentation. Uh, I didn't think you would get that far, and so um, I was kind of counting on coming back to chapter five tonight, and you uh, outran your punk coverage. You were you were out there. I mean, you 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 really ran through that whole whole section. And so uh, so compared to last week, tonight may be just a little bit more limited. In fact, um, uh, what I want to do tonight is I want to kind of, I want to connect chapter 5 and chapter 6, uh, and I think Corey did some of that last week, but I want to, I want to just kind of jump back into that a little bit and then just give a little of an introduction to the seals and then uh, while I've given you a handout for a, a reference, just ask you to bring it back next week, and we'll get into those scriptures. Uh, for the most part, we're not going to get into the seals tonight, but I want to give you kind of an introduction to that. And so we see this scene in heaven in chapter 4, and then in chapter 5, uh, we see the Lamb. And that's where I want to kind of begin our discussion tonight and how this relates to the seals, and you know, those seven seals, something that we don't normally think about. Uh, as Corey kind of pointed out, it's uh, those seven seals. We're, we're thinking about uh, this book or this scroll that has these seals on it, and, and these seals are, are uh, each one of them are released. And so I was going to do the, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, you, you, I mean, when we think about seals, a lot of times we, we, we're looking at this and we're we're, we're trying to think of it in our own um, association with the book of Revelation, and automatically we go to these 
apocalyptic images, and we've got all these different ideas. Um, and, and, and certainly, there is, there, there's a lot that's going on in this, but don't miss the, some of the simplicity of it as well. That this is a book that has been sealed, that's being opened up. So we'll, let's pray together, and then we'll talk about that and dive into this introduction into the seals tonight. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for the Lamb of God who was worthy uh, to take the book and to hold the book and even to open the book. Uh, thank you that he even now is ruling and reigning. And Lord, thank you for the reminder through the scriptures that not only are we uh, submitted to him as our king, uh, but we as joint heirs rule with him. And so we thank you for that privilege, and we pray that we would walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling that you've placed on our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, looking at this, I, I, I want us to think about chapter 6 as we're moving into this. And again, I think Corey did a great job. Uh, you recall that the, that the seals keep the book locked up. So remember in chapter 5, do we, we don't have to go back and read that again. Um, but remember as in chapter 5, this scene in heaven that John is weeping, and as John is weeping, he's weeping because no one is found to be worthy to open up the book. And so uh, on, we, we see in that scene, that vision, that, that the lamb comes. And this lamb is no ordinary lamb. In fact, this lamb is, is worthy. So he steps up, and he's able to, uh, he's found worthy to do so, and he takes that book in his, in his hand, and, and he's able to, uh, he's found worthy to do so. And the description that we see of him might be helpful just to go back and look at that. The description that we see, go back to chapter 5 for just a moment. I need some glasses tonight. And look in verse number 6, or verse number 5, excuse me, of chapter 5. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So the one that steps forward is, is the lion from the tribe of Judah, the lamb standing as if slain. And one of the interesting notes that I want to highlight is that he is standing. Now, when Corey looked last week, and accurately so, he went back to Daniel chapter 7, where you see this, this, this same thing is going on. Uh, it's the same imagery that's taking place. The vision that is in Daniel chapter 7 is what's happening in Revelation chapter 5. This is being fulfilled. In Daniel chapter 7, in the fulfillment of that vision, you see that the Lamb, then who is not standing as we see in chapter 5, but then is seated. And when he sits uh, at the right hand of God, he rules and reigns. That speaks of his kingdom. He enters into his everlasting kingdom. Y'all with me? But yet in chapter 5, even though he has the right, and even though he has the authority, and even though he is worthy to sit at the right hand of God, he does not yet sit. He is pictured there as standing. And, I, and in fact, he doesn't, he's not seated until he is seated and enthroned with the saints. And so here is Jesus who is uh, the lamb, and he's able to sit at the right hand of God, but it's not until his bride is made a queen, and she sits at his right side, that he sits at the right hand of God. And we'll see that play out as we walk through this book. And so, uh, in looking at this, you know, again, thinking about him, that he's standing, I think of the scene that's in chapter 7 of the book of Acts. Remember when Stephen is martyred, and as he looks up into heaven, a lot of times when people, uh, preachers will preach that passage, they'll talk about Jesus standing up uh, as if he's applauding uh, uh, Stephen because of what he's doing. I think there's more that's going on than that. It, it, it's, it's this idea that he's not seated and he's not sitting until those 
uh, humans are seated with him. And we'll, we'll see that as we walk through this book. So let's go back to the book that he's holding. Why is he referred to as a lamb? You see this vision. He's not a pretty lamb when we think about a lamb. I mean, he's got horns, and, and all this tells us that it's imagery, and it's something that we're supposed to draw from. But why is Jesus referred to as a lamb and a lion, uh, but not as what we would think maybe the Son of Man or the Son of God or something like that? Why, why is that? And I want to say that that fits with what we've been understanding about the way the Old Covenant is. Now, when we think about the Old Covenant, and we've talked about much of this, the Old Testament, as you think about the Old Covenant, one of the things that we've emphasized over and over is that the angels were ministers in the Old Covenant. And the angels, as, as it ministers in the Old Covenant, used animals to tutor the people. Let me, let me think about that for a moment. And, and this, this will help you when you see all these images like the, in the throne room where you see the, the ox and the, and the lion. Uh, and when, when you see these images there, you, you understand that God is using this. The angels tutored men through animals. When Adam is in the garden, all the, the animals are brought to him and he's to name all the animals. And they're... Uh, given dominion over them. And the serpent comes, an animal comes, to test Adam. And Adam fails to test. But it's, it's, it's a tutor. It's, it's meant to, to teach him something. You know, we always look at the serpent, and we look at it from the serpent's perspective, and we, we think about uh, how crafty, and, and certainly the Scriptures say that, we think about how deceitful he is. But from a righteous perspective, the serpent comes to tempt Adam and Eve, and Adam should have protected his wife and should have learned wisdom through this testing. So animals are tutors, or, or excuse me, angels use animals to tutor people. Think about the sacrificial system. What do you have going on in the sacrificial system? It is animals that are sacrificed. And so you go all through the Old Testament, look in the book of Proverbs, and you see much about animals there. All this in the Old Testament has much to do with animals. And so it's, it's the way that God has orchestrated the Old Covenant, and he's teaching us through these animals. And so angels tutored humanity through animals. And again, that helps us with the images of the ox and the lion and the eagle. So thinking about it in this, that that at the end of the, the Old Covenant, you know, thinking that animals were a part of worship, uh, worshiping God came through the sacrifice, you know, sacrifice of animals, uh, clean animals, they're unclean animals. All this is, is teaching us something in the Old Covenant. Cherubim had these animal faces. Uh, you were taught through animals all throughout the Old Testament. So at the end of the Old Covenant, a lion who was a lamb takes the book in his hand. Now, I want to show you how this bears out. Uh, we, we'll, we'll see this in Revelation chapter 20. When we get there, it is a man. It is Jesus who takes the books, and it is a man who judges in the new covenant. You see the transition that's taking place? Is this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> I, I know this is, this, this, is, this is a lot to kind of take in, um, and sometimes... I was listening to Corey last week, and I, I, I just, I get that enthusiasm. I mean, there's just so much that you want to say, and yet, you know, I want to bring you with me in this kind of thinking. And so that's part of the reason that we kind of slowed it down tonight so that we can think about it in this way. Because why all the animals? Why all the animals in the Old Testament? And much of that is, that's the way that God is teaching us. And so this Old Covenant is coming to an end. Uh, we talked about this, that, that the end of the Old Covenant, the end of the world, the Old World, the Old Covenant world, is coming to an end, and it comes to an end in 70 A.D. at the destruction of Jerusalem. And so there's a lot of things that are going on. The lion 
uh, that is from the, from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Um, he, he, this, this one that, as Corey pointed out, he's both a, he's a shoot and, and he is uh, the root. And, and, and all of that conveys what we should not miss in this is this Davidic kingly image. And so we should understand this scene. By the way, there are so many scenes that are going on in this, court, in this, in this setting. We've already talked about the, the it, it's, a, it's a temple setting. There's also, it's a divorce setting because God is divorcing Judah, Israel. He's, he, it's also a courtroom setting. He's bringing the charges against them. All, all of this is a part of this imagery. There, I mean, there are so many things that are going on at one time. And as well, it is a kingly image. And so when we, when we think about the book, I don't know if your mind goes there. Um, Corey brought up about the Old Covenant, and I, and I certainly I, I agree with what he's saying. I, I don't think it's confined just to uh, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Um, when we think about the books of the Old Testament or the book of the Old Testament, uh, you think about the law a king, when a king ruled, he had a, the, the book, the, the covenant was to be before him every day. Let, let me, I feel like I'm not getting through. Go, go to Deuteronomy chapter 18 for a moment, and we'll kind of see that. You know what, go to Deuteronomy 17. How about that? Deuteronomy chapter 17. And, and by the way, Deuteronomy, if, you, if you're a Bible student, you know that's the first, you know, that's the fifth book of the Old Testament. It's the, the, the uh, book of the law, second book of the law, Deuteronomy. But it is, um, it, 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 is, it is before the kings. So it's, it, this, is, this is early, okay, before the kings. But yet, God had already made plans that there was going to be a king. And he tells them, look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18. And he says, now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, and he may, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. Now, sometimes we get the idea that God didn't plan for a king, but he always planned for a king. When the people asked God for a king in 1 Samuel, he wasn't upset that they were coming to him asking about a king. He was upset because they had rejected him. What they wanted was a king who would fight their battles for them. And so they, they and instead of trusting God to fight the battles for them, they wanted a king, just like the, the, the other peoples, just like the, other, like the rest of the world, the Gentiles. They, they wanted that kind of king. But it, it, it had been part of, this is in the book of the law, it had been part of God's plan that they would have a king. And he tells that when this king rules, that he's to have this book. And you remember the, the story as it goes through Israel, the, 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 the law gets lost, and, and, and it's not there. The kings are not ruling with it. And you remember Josiah, that he, he, uh, uh, they, they find the, the, the book, they find the law, they find the covenant, and they bring it out. And then Josiah begins to, to tear down all the idols. Well, Jesus is one who rules with the book. Jesus is one who is greater than Josiah. 
don't miss the imagery of taking the book. Now, I don't think it's confined to a book of rules. I think, I think the, uh, the covenant is, is, as we saw in Deuteronomy, I think that's, that's a part of it. As we'll talk about a little bit later, it's, it's, there's, there's probably even more that's there. That being said, no one is worthy uh, to open up the book, this scene that we see in Revelation chapter 5. And as we look at the covenant, and Corey pointed this out last week, that the, that the covenant has both blessings and cursings. Now, think about this from the perspective of John who is weeping. And, and he's weeping because no one is fit to, to rule. No one is fit to take the, the, the book. No one is, is, is worthy to open up the book. We think about the seals in the opening up of the book from a negative perspective. We start thinking about that all, everything's going to break loose, and, and, and you're looking at this scene there, and it looks like everything is horrible. But why is John weeping? And part of the reason I think that he's weeping is that in the opening up of these seals, as these seven seals are, are opened up and the book is opened up and unfolded, that there's cursings that come that are brought upon that, that first world, that first creation, if you will. The old covenant people all throughout the world, but there's blessings that come. And so as we, as we walk through in the weeks ahead, we begin to walk through those seven uh, seals, we're going to see, yeah, we're going to see the, the bad things that are happening, that God is bringing, ju- that he's bringing judgment on the wicked, but he's also bringing blessing. You think about this from all the Psalms and you're reading in the Old Testament. Uh, some of you are familiar with the imprecatory Psalms where, where uh, they seem to be, as we read them from a New Testament perspective, looking back on it, we're thinking, man, that is harsh. Uh, because they are praying that God will, will come and judge the wicked. That, that uh, he, he will shatter their teeth and, 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 and uh, you know, crush them. I mean, I mean, some of those things are very graphic in the way that you read this. And, and what they're praying for is that God will bring justice. All throughout the old, uh, that old world, it, it appears that the wicked are prospering, and you see this even in the, in the prophets when you read there, uh, they're saying, you know, how long, you know, why, why is it? It seems like they're the ones that are prospering while we're being uh, held down and, and, and persecuted. God, when are you going to do something about that? And that's what happens in the opening of the seven seals. God judges the old world, and he judges the wicked, and those prayers are answered. And so that kind of helps us in thinking about the context. And, you know, but, but why does he take so long? Well, as, as you see these, these, these seals that are, that are uh, being opened up, and, and there's seven of them, oftentimes when you're reading, and I just gave you a portion of it tonight, I think the first six are there. But, it, but as you read through that, there's one section in there that looks like, in, in fact, in my Bible, it's called an interlude where you see six seals are opened up, and then there's an interlude in heaven. It's not going to be on your handout, but it's, in, it's in, your, in your Bible if you're reading from New American Standard, which I'm reading from, and it'll say an interlude. So six seals, boom, 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 six things, and then there's, there's this long period that happens, and it's, and, it's, and it's titled in mine as an interlude, and then the seventh seal happens. And the problem with that is it breaks up what's going on over that time. And what I mean by that is we, we shouldn't look at it as six and one, but these are, these are seven that has taken place. And the reason that, that, and we're told this in that passage, that the reason, you read this in chapter seven and chapter eight, the reason that God uh, pauses after the sixth seal is because he's, he's waiting for, for those, who, those martyrs, to, those to be martyred, he's waiting until that number of the elect is complete before he breaks open the seventh seal, where the blessing comes. 
Let me put it in a different terminology. The martyrs who, who, are, who are just, they're, they're waiting. You know, how long? How long? They're waiting. And, and God is patient. God's holy. He's, he's not like us. He, he's, he's allowing the, the cup, so to speak, of the blood of the martyrs to come up to the tipping point to where when it's full and when it's complete, then the seventh seal comes. Think about this in the terms of Abraham. Uh, remember that God had promised Abraham that he would have this promised land. But remember that the uh, Amorites, had, their, their sins had not yet come up to fulfillment. He, he's waiting. So, so in other words, he, he's waiting until, until this sin gets to, to, to the tipping point where God says, that's it. And that's, that's such a good parallel, because, because when that sin comes up to that point, then God allows and God, God, God sends uh, his people into the promised land. It's at that point that Abraham's seed takes the promised land. You see the parallel? God's allowing for the martyrs to, to build up, and when that blood gets to that certain point... Then his people, he brings judgment and he brings blessing that his people then inherit the blessings of God. So that, that's kind of a, um, an, an overview and kind of a, 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 an introduction to think about as we're transitioning into chapter 5, into chapter 6, in the seals, that, that, that the seals... You, you should see them as they're they're holding back this book that that it's going to that when king jesus moves into his kingdom and is ruling and reigning and and again i'm thinking past that these seals are holding back both the judgment of the old world that was judged in 70 AD and the blessing of the new covenant in the new world that comes in 70 AD. So these things begin to simultaneously take place. So, so you got these, these seven seals, and then simultaneously what comes out of that is the seven trumpets, and we'll see that maybe next year. Maybe, maybe after, maybe, maybe uh, I say next year. Um, I'm talking school year because we, we will, we're going to work through this, and my, my goal is to get through the seals uh, by the end of the month, and then we're going to take a summer break, an interlude. We're going to take a summer break and then come back in the fall and finish out the book. One last parallel I'd like to, I'd like to point out, something that I think would be helpful for us to see, is, uh, is that, and I, I gave it to you on the back of your notes, is that there is a correlation between um, the seven seals and the seven days of creation. And Corey alluded to some of this and, and some of the other points. You know, we, there's sevens all through the book of Revelation. But you think about, uh, he, he alluded to this fact that there are four days without, without blessing and there are three days with blessing. And there's this four three thing that's going on. And it, and it lays perfectly with what we see with these seven seals, too. There's, there's four horsemen, and then you see these three things that take place after that. We'll get into the details of that later, but I just want to kind of walk through this. And I, I've given you something maybe just to take a couple notes. I'm not going to make it too heavy, but, but um, there's a correlation between these seven seals and the seven days of creation. And, and before I get into this, I, I just want to give credit to two men, uh, Jim Jordan and Peter Lightheart, for their insights on this, because without their help, uh, I don't know that I would have saw these things, and so just want to say that. But the seven seals uh, judge the world, or the cosmos, according to Genesis chapter 1. So here's the correlation. The first one, where we see that first 
the seal being opened up, the lion, the cherub. Um, the first horse is the white horse. And by the way, that word white is the same white that's used to describe Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. I mean, it's used elsewhere, but, but it's, a, it's a bright white. Uh, this, this, this first horse is, is a bright white horse like the light. Let there be light on day one. And then the second one where you see the ox and the cherub, uh, the red horse divides and separates. And so when you think about the second day of creation, you think about the firmament, and there is this, this red horse comes, there's a div- division and separation. And then the third day, where you see the man cherub, the bread wine, and oil come from plants made on the third day. On day three, grain and fruit trees sprang from the earth. And the, the rider that comes on a black horse depletes grains through fruit, fruit trees and vines are protected. We'll get into this, but the, the grain is representative of the old covenant and the wine of the new covenant, and this is, this is what's going on. But the point I want to make is that there's a direct correlation between what you see in the third seal and the day three. And then fourthly, the flying eagle cherub, luminary, death, and underworld. The, the rider that comes in on the green horse is death and Hades comes from him, and so like the sun and the moon, death and Hades have authority over the earth. Now, fifthly, I, just, I want to tell you everything, but I just, you know, I want, <laughs> I want to go ahead and just interpret all these things, but, but just staying with the parallel, uh, there's, a, there's a, a swarm, the swarm are, are told to wait. When, when the lamb breaks the fifth seal, there's a, there's a, a swarm of, of martyrs appears under the altar, and, and their, their uh, prayers ascend like smoke. Uh, they're given robes. Uh, swarming things, incense, and clothing are all linked with the fifth day. What comes on the sixth day? Man, right? Well, the sixth seal reveals humanity. So it, it's both humanity that's doomed, and then also we see the first fruits of a, a, a new humanity that is protected. This is the, the eschatological humanity, the, the, the last time humanity, doing what humanity was created to do, which is worshiping God. And what's interesting is if you, if you kind of look ahead, I've, I've been able to put down those uh, six uh, that are there. I, I think you have those. But as you get into day six, or when you're reading the creation account, day six is lengthy compared to the other before it. And the same thing happens in the seals, the day six, that the sixth seal is, is very long. It's longer than the other seals. And then the seventh seal, which you would expect, correlates to the Sabbath. It's the day of judgment and blessing arrives. So the silence... The silences of the seventh seal, as well as the prayers of the golden altar, link the seventh day, the Sabbath day, with the seventh seal. So the Sabbath that closes the week of the seals simultaneously, as I mentioned, begins with the trumpets. So, the, the, you know, without getting too technical, you, you could take that, you could take those seals. And, and the little bit of information that I've given you, and you can go back to the creation account, and it's amazing how close and how you can see that. And, and you know, the, the old expression that the devil is in the details, well, he's not nearly in the details that God is in. God, God is in the details. And you think about from the beginning to the end. Now, these, you know, the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation and, and, and just how closely these things are and how detailed those things are. And all throughout the Scriptures, all of these things are intricately woven. And I think about that in our own lives. And we sometimes, you know, we think that we're in a situation or going through something, and we think it's, it's so small or so minor 
that maybe God is not concerned, but he is. I mean, this is, this is, this is a personal God that we serve. This is an intimate God that we serve. And he is concerned, and he does care for every detail of our life. And not only does he care for every detail of our life, but he is intricately involved in every detail of our life. There is nothing that does happen or does not happen that is not out of the mind of God, out of the will of God, and out of the decree of God. God, God is intricately involved. And, and even in the midst of uh, trials, in the midst of sin, in the midst of uh, persecution, God is still working his purposes. And if we are believers in Christ, then we can claim that promise of Romans 8.28, that God works all things together for good, for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, but if we're not his, then we can't claim that promise. But if we belong to him, then even though I might not see it and I might not understand it, God's word tells me that it's true. Well, the last thing I want to mention before I close out is that I mentioned about the book, and, and uh, some see it as the, the, uh, the new covenant. Um, as Corey mentioned last week, others see it as, as the whole word of God. Others think of it as the book of life, and, and others as the record of the old creation that's now being brought to an end. Well, which is it? Well, it, it might be all of them. You know, the truth is, is that, as Corey wrestled with last week, uh, we're just wrestling through these things and trying to understand these things. My goal is not to name everything like what the book is. My, my goal is to try to help us to understand and to, and to understand the imagery that is there. And uh, going back to Deuteronomy 29, 29, uh, the secret things belong to the Lord, but those things that are revealed are for us and for our children and our children's children. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for this study. And we thank you for this book that I, I trust that some may even hesitate to study. Uh, but Lord, it is your word. And it is not a book that we uh, should run from or be afraid of, but it is a book that speaks of the victorious reigning rule of our Lord. And so may we walk in his victory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.